Oh, Jay Rose, and today I would like to talk about Oppenheimer because in the same way that I think Drive My Car is one of the most fantastic um, films about Lacan and psychoanalysis, uh, I think there's a lot in Oppenheimer that actually is about sexuality, desire, and, um, and really I would say Oppenheimer is about sex. Uh, much of the movie is about sex, and I, I know that might sound outlandish, but uh, I think that's a theme that is running through the entire movie. And if I were to put it in terms of a thematic command sentence to allude to Andrew and Alex's work, um, as they had on the meaning code, you could say is don't let your need for release cause a chain reaction outside of your control. Um, now, a few more comments. Um, I think the acting was tremendous. The film was tremendous. I hope uh, director Christopher Nolan wins the best picture. Um, I think uh, the music was amazing. It, uh, it's shocking that three hours went by so quickly. Uh, the, the, the various people who appeared in the movie, you know, Bohr, Heisenberg, Gert Gertel, um, Einstein, all these different characters, I thought was just really neat how they were in the film. There was also a number of very top-notch actors who made cameos and appearances that didn't feel forced and they, I, felt, I thought it was really nice how they kind of fit into the work. And it really, the film should be given great credit for bringing out this period of history or this, the Manhattan Project that I do think doesn't get elucidated. Like what was going on at these different universities it, at this project, it's an entire world that can be forgotten. And I think the movie um, was extraordinary to bring to life that period of history. And really also how these scientists, these physicists, these mathematicians, these academics, these engineers were so central to a war effort or how they had these kind of networks, these extended networks where they interacted. Um, really amazing how the movie brought that out. Um, I thought uh, Robert Downey Jr. was tremendous in the film. Brad Pitt was tremendous in the film. Just absolutely stunning. Um, so there's a few things. Um, I do think the movie has a lot to say about sexuality. The, the first thing is the most obvious example is the sex scene in the movie when Oppenheimer reads the Sanskrit and his extremely famous line, you know, I am now death, destroyer of worlds. When the Trinity atom bomb goes off, and notice the tower is quite a phallic symbol, but when the, when the bomb goes off, and do, do warn, um, I know the life of Oppenheimer and uh, Los Alamos, these are all things of history and there's not really a lot of spoilers, but there will be a lot of spoilers in this conversation and we will also be speaking freely about sexuality. Um, and I think, again, but I think it's very relevant and I think the way that Christopher Nolan has thematically brought the movie together according to that theme is quite, quite extraordinary. Um, so um, when the bomb goes off and it's completely silent, silence, and you have the repeating of that line. And in that silence, it's like the breathing of uh, intercourse. Uh, and then he repeats the line, I am the destroyer of worlds. Well, what you have there is the release. Um, which, funny enough, in the sex scene with Oppenheimer and his first wife, uh, it does seem like there is no release, that the, that the sex ends before release. And he seems like Oppenheimer seems bothered by that. And she goes over and gets the, the, the Sanskrit and resumes. So there's this kind of idea that the release leads to the nuclear bomb. And one cannot help that when they find out Hitler is dead, it's like they don't want to have all their work and all their labor go to naught. Like they want to set off the bomb and they convince themselves, oh, it'll bring about world peace. Which then, of course, seems like once you get sexual release, you know, then your dreams will come true and you'll finally have um, unity and peace, you know, final rest, a cosmic ocean in a Freudian sense. And here we start seeing the Lacan. Um, so there's kind of this convention, we don't want all our work to go to nothing. We want that release. We want to see the bomb go off. And likewise, we, as the viewers of the movie, want to see the bomb go off, right? Uh, we don't want to not have a scene of the explosion of the bomb. Uh, so likewise, we want to that occur, which would suggest the need for release then precisely leads into not stopping a chain reaction that then le the book, you know, the movie ends with that, you know, with that extraordinary line the movie ended with. What, a, what an extraordinary way to end the movie with, um, you know, we, we were worried about starting a chain reaction that ended the world. I think we did. What a brilliant, brilliant way to end that movie. Um, and, um, and then also where the senator that played by Robert Downey Jr. or the president of MIT, I can't remember his exact name, Strauss, I think it was, 
um, you know, he's thinking about Einstein and, and, um, and Oppenheimer are talking about him, but really they're talking about something bigger and he doesn't matter so much. And that also just kind of goes to show how they as scientists are thinking about something else. We're, we're focused on petty things and immediacy, but we're not really thinking about how our actions can like, you know, destroy the world or have a big impact. We're all kind of lost in our ego. So anyway, there's this kind of idea that the bomb is a result of, um, a sexual release and inability to avoid the release and it's very interesting as well because something interesting about the movie is that we really never see the war we never see the germans we never see the armies you know we see german scientists but not hitler we see no nazis um we never see japan they function as the organizer of all the action and yet they're not present in the movie at all kind of like lacan's big other you know, there is no big other, really. And there is a real sense in which there is no Nazis in the movie. There are no Japanese in the movie. There is no threat. There are no Russians in the movie. They're all elsewhere. They're all other. And, um, you know, the only kind of leader we see is Truman, and he comes off as somewhat ridiculous uh, when, he, when he appears. Um, but, the, but the threat that kind of drives all the action is not present. And that, you know, that big other... Um, of whom, you know, we're trying to re get the object of desire, we're trying to overcome the big other, but there is no big other. And actually, we enjoy having the obstacle of the big other precisely to give us the release that we want. We, you know, the movie, it's like we want, like Oppenheimer, it's kind of suggested that he wants to be famous, he wants to be known, and so you want there to be a big other that's a threat, so you can finish your project and get the release that you wanted. So there's kind of a Lacanian structure that's going on there. The other thing that's very interesting is we see in Emily Blunt, the wife of Oppenheimer, she doesn't seem like she wants to be a mother. She, uh, there's this one scene where the child looks like, the child is like choking and she almost ignores the child, entirely red and crying and just doesn't even pay attention to the child. Well, the, the, what we see here is a desire for sexual release but not responsibility. We don't want to have kids like Oppenheimer doesn't want to be responsible for the bomb in the same way that Emily Blunt doesn't want to have children or doesn't want to be responsible for children. Um, and, and that's kind of a theme. And and so, likewise, how do you come to, uh, like, how, there's this interesting then kind of navigation on now that you've had children, now that you've created the bomb, how do you relate to the kid? How do you relate to the bomb? Um, you know, at one point, Oppenheimer passes their, their child off to a friend, to someone else. Uh, likewise, the bomb gets passed off to Truman or gets passed off to the military. But at that point, um, you know, Oppenheimer can kind of feel guilt about it, right? Uh, likewise, if parents pass off their children, there can be guilt about that. So how do you go about navigating that guilt? And another area that the movie um, explores, so you have this parenting theme, that kind of like not wanting the children. Um, you have this sexual release theme that's going on. Um, you also have, um, the kind of critically, like the movie suggests that Oppenheimer may want to be trashed and tarred. So like he had no problem picking where the bomb would be dropped. So that, that's kind of one of the big kind of revelations is this idea of he had more, no moral qualm at the beginning of the project, but then later on did. You know, why is that? Well, because if he develops this moral qualm, then he can be hated by the administration and then martyred. And there's this sense in which if he's martyred, then he won't be held responsible for the nuke, right? And the movie almost kind of like questions that. It's like, are we sewing Oppenheimer as a martyr? Therefore, he's not to be held for, responsible for what he did, right? So the movie itself functions as perhaps providing excuse for Oppenheimer in the movie in a, in a very meta move, questions itself. But you see here, there's a sexuality kind of um, like masochism say, where you enjoy being tarred and feather, like you get a sexual urge, like enjoyment, kind of in being, having power over you. And what you have here is Oppenheimer using the very fact that he's being mistreated to then not be responsible for the bomb. And kind of as, as the, the Downey character says, Robert Downey's character says, he becomes like famous for Trinity, but not for Hiroshima Shima or Nawasaki. The other thing that's interesting is there's this idea when Einstein is talking to Oppenheimer, and it's like, oh, you'll get rewards, medals, people will shake your hands, but it won't be for you, it'll be for them. And then kind of Emily Blunt refuses to shake that one scientist's hand. There's an idea that you, you want release and you want everyone to be happy and to you know, let stuff move on. You don't want to hold inside 
the conflict or the raids and so you're looking for peace you're looking to forgive people and shake hands and kind of emily blunt refuses to shake the scientist's hand which would be a kind of release and letting things go but then that would let the person who's trying to um feel better uh, about what they did, um, feel better about what they did. So you deny them that, but that requires you resisting the urge to forgive, basically, or d to resist the urge to say it's okay. And there's a kind of release in that, um, in that saying it's okay that you're denying. So you have this very interesting dynamic here throughout the movie on exploring the need to create, the, the need to desire to engage in libidinal energies but then the very the, the libidinal energies have to resist the urge to release it sometimes, or it can start a chain reaction. If you do have the release, you can start a chain reaction that ends the world, or a chain reaction that leads to power becoming more powerful, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think also you saw in the entire trial structure examples of where humans themselves don't know what they desire or they don't know who they are. That's another thing throughout the movie. Why are you doing this? You know, what is the point of all this? Why are we doing this? There's a lot of questions of motives. Well, in Lacan, there's a whole lot of self-deception. There's a whole lot of we trying to avoid facing ourselves, seeing ourselves, And I think we see that in the character of Oppenheimer. And, and that's all overlaid with this question of desire. So what does the physicist want? Well, they want to build a bomb. They want to discover the universe. Okay, well, they did that, and they just wanted to see what would happen if they set off the bomb. Well, they saw that, and then they're like, crap, we got what we wanted, but now we want to have distance from it. And we see Oppenheimer letting himself, or per perhaps positioning himself, to be tarred and feathered precisely so that he could have the enjoyment of the experiment and the discovery and being famous without being responsible for that. And that's a move of sexuality that I think is very common and very difficult to avoid. But if we don't avoid it, the consequences can be quite, quite dire. Um, I think there are other, I think the theme of sexuality in the movie is quite strong. I think it's powerful. I think we see, I think Christopher Nolan is definitely sort of bringing together sexuality and death. There is a kind of little death in the orgasm. There's a little death in the um, climax. And the entire movie is suggesting that that climax is death. And if you give in to that climax, then it can start a chain reaction that you cannot escape. So I think looking at Oppenheimer through terms of sexuality, I think that sex was very prominent. Also just that scene where Oppenheimer is you know, being questioned and he's naked, basically. Uh, he's naked and having sex in front of everyone. Like this too suggests um, the, the sexual themes and when you're being questioned because language, it was very interesting how much language was a part of the, um, the movie and basically a trial structure. Well, the con psychoanalysis is all about everything that's said and what is said and how the truth comes out in what is said and how the, the language and the kind of gymnastics that we engage shows what we really desire and what we really are trying to do. And there was this one point where Oppenheimer seemed basically trapped and having to admit that he wanted to be martyred precisely so he wasn't responsible for his children. He could be famous but not responsible. And I'll just add to clarify the point, Oppenheimer cannot be an American Prometheus, which is the name of the book that Nolan based his film on, unless he's eaten by buzzards, per se. You know, if we have a Prometheus that gives man fire, and then, you know, man burns himself alive with fire, we'd probably hate Prometheus. But it's precisely the fact that Prometheus pays a price for what he does that makes him a sympathetic figure. So likewise, Oppenheimer positions himself to be a sympathetic figure. And it's just interesting because, again, like we were saying, Strauss and even Truman talk about how, you know, they tried to make Oppenheimer responsible for Trinity, but not Nawasaki or Hiroshima. And so you would kind of go, well, doesn't that mean he's innocent of the bombing? Well, it's as if Oppenheimer understands that if he's not punished, that it's only a matter of time before history remembers him as um, as actually guilty for all of them. And so he has to, it's not merely enough for Strauss and Truman to position him as uh, responsible for Trinity as a scientific genius. He has to suffer. And you see Oppenheimer position himself that way. And, um, you know, if like in a Gerard way, you have people enjoy repression, enjoy being sexually um, held back or oppressed, you can have an enjoyment, um, a geaisance, that term I can never say, that Oppenheimer can have in his torture, in the buzzards eating him. But it's just very interesting because then the very subtle, brilliant feminism of the film shows how we, even we as viewers of the film, when we see Emily Blunt 
passing off her child or failing as a mother, mother, we have like no sympathy for her. We just see her as monstrous. Um, and yet Oppenheimer is doing the same thing. So what is the difference between the male and the female? There seems to be easier in some ways for the male to create something that can destroy the world and be, you know, we can feel sympathetic for him. Whereas a, a mother who is facing the consequences of the release of the end of the sexual act, we're not so sympathetic for if she distances herself from her procreation from what she creates. And the paper will hopefully elaborate on these points, but you see a kind of double standard, and the question is why this double standard? And you can say, well, it's not the same. Well, maybe it's not, but it's just interesting how we have a man named Oppenheimer who has created a bomb that could destroy the world, and yet it seems easier to sympathize with him. And maybe even if we know, like even if we know that he may have arranged his own, uh, you know, martyrdom, it even then can seem easier to sympathize with him than Emily Blunt or a mother that doesn't uh, raise her children. And maybe that also speaks to why Emily Blunt is uh, more aware of the danger of letting release, you know, of giving in to release, shaking the hand at the end. She's more aware. Maybe the feminine is more aware of the consequences of release and the end of release. That doesn't mean release is always bad. That doesn't mean children are bad. But there's more of a wisdom there, a feminine wisdom. Um, that Oppenheimer does not seem aware of or that seems to um, evade, seems to evade masculinity more than femininity. Um, but what also can be said is that the feminine seems able to hold in, to um, hold in the tension, to hold the tension, sort of like a mother holding a child. And that's why they're able to withstand not giving in to release, where the male seems less able to do it. And that's where we see feminine characters throughout the film. You know, it's a female leading the meeting about stopping the Manhattan Project because it's no longer needed. It's Emily Blunt that's not shaking the hand. So there, there's an ability to hold in the tension, to hold in the, the idea of doing work that doesn't lead to anything that is stressed by the feminine. And that could easily be because the female is more aware of where release can lead, how release changes the world, and you can never go back. It starts to, you know, once a child is born, a chain reaction has started. That cannot be undone for good and for bad. Maybe the nuke does, and there is no World War III because of the nuke, right? Maybe, maybe Oppenheimer's right about that. Maybe war is over. Then again, maybe we're all doomed. Hard to say. The point is that once something starts, it cannot stop. Once you give in to the release, it cannot stop. And this is a profound reality to take seriously. Um, and what's funny is, can we really take it seriously? Like, it's, it's, it's a big deal once you really realize that the choices we make can start chain reactions, and instead we kind of watch a movie. And there's something interesting about, do we enjoy a movie about all this? But if we really, really thought about what the movie is telling us, we couldn't enjoy it at all. So we always maybe have to create distance between what we're seeing and what, we're, what, what we really are seeing, Likewise, between action and doing like Oppenheimer so that we can function. Um, but that also means we have to, if we're not going to function in that kind of abstracting way, that means we're going to have to learn to hold more within. We're going to need more of a feminine logic. And are we ready, ready for that today? Um, that might be part of our challenge. Anyway, I think Oppenheimer is a masterpiece. I think um, there's a lot of ideas that are going on there. I mean, you can even talk about, like, you have a barren wasteland. There's nothing there, and then something grows, something develops. There's nothing, and then there's life ex nihilo. There's a seed, there's an egg, then there's a baby. You know, there's birth, there's creation. There, there, I think the movie is indeed playing on and speaking to sexuality in very profound and fascinating ways. And I think Christopher Nolan has given us a masterpiece, and I would suggest the movie very much so.